other oh, beloved husband, faithful. Oh, and father, beloved husband, father, of course.
We are gathered here at the Norwegian Siemens Church in San Francisco in order to say farewell to Captain Ole Kalle. He was born March 8, 1928, and he passed away this year on December 16, 2014. Today is the day of mourning, especially for you who are the nearest of kin lost your father, your husband, grandfather, uncle, brother, and also for all of you who have lost a good friend. But there are good memories, and uh, this is what we're going to focus on today. It's good memories after Ola. And uh, the family's going to read a few, read the eulogy, and they're going to be um, people from the congregation, friends, who are going to have remembrances a little later on. And as you see, we have the urn with Ola's remains with us. And in the Norwegian tradition, the committal is actually one of the most important things that you do. So therefore, we uh, talked a little bit about it and we decided to have that. So we're going to do the committal here at the very end of the service. Let us pray. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or brought forth the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn men back to dust, saying, Return to dust, O sons of men. For a thousand years is in your sight, are like a day, that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. O oh Lord, teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Amen. And I will continue to read from the scripture, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of the death, I will fare no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all days, all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I continue to read from the letter of Paul to the Corinthians, the first letter. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast. It is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always preserves. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be still. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. Now we see but a poor reflection, as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain. <coughs> Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. <clears throat> I think we all know, or most of us know, that life is uh, 
transition, it's a change, a constant change. And hopefully most of you have had some experiences in life where you had some expectations. It's not long since we celebrated Christmas, and for those of you who are younger, of course, you live in those weeks before, you have expectations. There is something there. Something is going to happen. Well, if you're so lucky that you're a Norwegian or a Swede, it will happen on the 24th. <laughs> of course. A little earlier. But still, it is not really Christmas until the 25th <clears throat> at midnight. Then, of course, we do celebrate the birth of Christ. But the weeks before, at least in Norway, we have a color for those weeks. It is the color of purple. This color can, you know, it's a symbol for many, many things. It is a, a color of repentance that we prepare ourselves to meet, you know, the newborn child, God's gift to us by repenting. But again, it's also a color of expectation. That we do look forward to something. But as you see, I'm wearing the purple color today. And it's because it also is the color of mourning. Of course. So, there is a connection between mourning and expectation in this church, in what we believe in. And today, it's, I think it's very hard for you to see that. But I think it's very important that we do remind each other that although there is mourning here today, we all, we all have, have, have heavy hearts. But we should also hear the word that there is something coming. We do have certain expectations in life that will only come to its fulfillment when we die. So there is this paradox in the church, in our message, saying it is actually through death that this hope will come to its fulfillment. We do all know the story of Christ. We celebrate his birth these days. When Easter comes, we in a way celebrate his death. His death was important to us because that's when he made and paved a new road back to God. But Easter morning is what we really celebrate in the church. When he rose from the dead. But he had to go through death in order to get the new life. And in that sense, he paved a new road for us. A road that goes through death, but will end in the new life. And this has been said from ancient time. Humankind has expected, or at least they have hoped and yearned for this. Because death is such a meaningless thing. But then Christ came and created a hope, an expectation in death and in mourning. And I would just shortly read a passage that was said a long, long time ago, way before Christ was born. It is a prophecy of he who came to earth that we celebrate on Christmas Eve. The prophet Isaiah said, says, he will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears of all faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. It is a day of mourning, but it is also a day. Before we continue with the eulogy, we will sing the great hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. <laughs> Oh, yes. 
wonderful man we know. His influence was profound. He taught us everything. To swim, to ride a bike, to ski, to drive, to parallel park outside this church. <laughs> <laughs> to give service, to be respectful of ourselves and of others. He encouraged us to be independent, to be educated, to rely only on oneself. We are so grateful for his guidance. We are fortunate to have this loving and supportive force behind us. Our daddy saw our individual gifts and strengths, inspiring each of us to achieve our dreams, believing in all of his girls unconditionally. It was important to my dad that we had character, that we had a moral compass, I feel connected to my dad when I share this wisdom with others. He gave us his everything, and he was determined to stay here as long as he could. It hurts to let him go, but I feel comforted. He knew where he was headed, and that's where I will picture him, in paradise. I love you, Daddy. As all of you know, Dad was a very special man. In this brief, excuse me, in this brief moment, it is impossible to reflect the profound and far-reaching impact he had on our lives, but we will try. On March 8, 1928, Ulaf and Sophia Calvi welcomed Ula, Ula to this world, the fourth of their eight children. He grew up on an island called Smerholmen in Fitcher, Norway, surrounded by the sea. The family had a business, building boats, and there was plenty of work to keep everyone busy. The family was close-knit and supportive, and Dad had many fond memories from his childhood with his immediate and extended family. He also experienced his fair share of difficult times in his childhood and youth. The family overcame significant economic hardship, ship, losing and then regaining their family home. They also suffered through World War II with an occupying German military force when the family was actively <coughs> involved in the Norwegian resistance. Ulla, at 14 years of age, asked to be able to join other members of the family in the resistance in Scotland. His mother wept in response, feeling her son was too young, and the decision was made that he would remain at home. Later, in a terrible tragedy after the war, the family lost two of their children at sea during a flash storm. For some of us, overprotective and sheltering parents, the freedom and independence that dad enjoyed as a young child is difficult to conceive. The kids would frequently go swimming, exploring, and boating on their own. At the age of five, dad had his first sailboat and skippered that. By the time he was eight, having watched the big ships pass by the island, he determined that he would be a sea captain. At 17, dad left the island to start his formal training and a life of adventure. He graduated from the Maritime Academy in Bergen, eventually earning a Master Mariner's ticket in 1958. He excelled in his studies and his assignments, and in 1960, at just 32 years of age, he was promoted to captain. In his capacity as captain, he traveled the globe, amassing a wealth of experiences which he loved sharing with us years later. He appeared to be a confirmed bachelor until 1964, when our mom <laughs> was assigned to his ship, and everything changed. Mom was a young radio officer, newly graduated and on her first assignment. They got to know each other with little talks after her shifts, she drinking solo orange soda and he drinking wine. <laughs> a romantic courtship followed and it wasn't long before he decided he wanted to spend the rest of his life with Kari. They were married in Gothenburg, Sweden on January 23rd, 1965 at the Siemens Church. This next section is titled, Both of My Parents Love Children. <laughs> <laughs> they always planned to have between four and six kids, and they got started right away. I was born 10 months after they were married, and Steve just 17 months after me. 
As the family of the captain, we used to travel with him, but as we approached school age, that would no longer be possible. At that point, dad decided to take an office job so he would not be away from the family for those extended periods of time. He took a job as a business administrator with Star Shipping in San Francisco. They planned to remain there for two to five years before returning to Bergen, but that time was obviously extended. <laughs> the family continued to grow as Rilla arrived shortly after the move to California. Our sister Christina came next. She was only with us. Excuse me. A brief but beautiful six months. As difficult as that loss was, mom recalls how worried dad was for her well-being and describes him as being her rock, so sensitive and supportive during that difficult time. Fortunately for us, dad was able to convince her to continue growing our family and we were blessed with our two youngest sisters, Caroline and Erica. We girls grew up in a very loving and secure environment. My dad worked worked hard in the office and at home on various home improvement projects, large and small or not so small. My mom worked hard to keep order in the house and her growing girls clothed and fed. We had wonderful rituals like family night when all of us got to choose our candy bars at the market and we stayed home and played games or watched a movie together and enjoyed our treats. Before bed, dad would inspect our breath to make sure we had brushed. <laughs> Sometimes we cheated by just spreading a little toothpaste. <laughs> we recall the fun we had when we ran past his chair laughing and screaming as he would pretend to try to spank us as we went by. <laughs> we also enjoyed many family outings like trips to Lake Lagunitas for crawdad fishing and picnics and barbecues at the beach. On family vacations, uh, he taught us all to ski and fish and camp. We let, he loved sharing his passions with us. So much of what dad taught us was by example. He was always industrious, hardworking, and reliable. He was creative and ambitious in how he approached his projects, but modest and understated when discussing his achievements. There was never any question that he could, we could count on him for anything that was important. He was devoted to his family and his community and he showed that by his actions. He also taught us to always strive to achieve and to be our best, just as he had done. When I told him at age eight I wanted to be a nurse, he countered with the question, why don't you become a doctor? <laughs> Having few female role models for this, the idea had not even occurred to me, but I quickly adjusted to and embraced it and made it my own. He wanted and got all of his girls to be strong and independent. He was sensitive and wise as he guided his girls in their development. He honored the excuse me, individuality of each child and encouraged all of us to find our passion in life. He never used unkind words or labels in discipline, but would succinctly share words or observations that would make us truly think about our choices and our actions in difficult situations. He nurtured in us a strong sense of right and wrong that was clear and easy to understand. He also instilled in us a strong sense of our responsibility to our family. When the older girls went to college, our father had to talk with each of us. He told us that he hoped that this would be a gift, this education would be a gift from him and my mom, but if something happened to him and my mother, it would be our responsibility as the older children to make sure that our younger sisters had the same opportunity. <coughs> as his girls got married and started having children, it was delightful to see the pleasure he took in his grandchildren. The mere thought of them would make his eyes light up and bring a joyful smile to his face. Sometimes it even looked like his eyes were welling up, but apparently that was just a manifestation of the clogged tear ducts that he blamed in those initial moments. The grandkids took turns over the years as each of them had their best of far wrapped around their cute little fingers. When we were young, my dad was the epitome of strength to us, both physically and spiritually. 
When he flexed his biceps, the muscle was massive. <laughs> it was defined and it was rock hard. Not your typical office worker, but more like the character Mr. Incredible. We loved pushing on it and hanging from his arm like little monkeys. As dad grew older, it was difficult to see him lose that strength. It just didn't seem right. Even as he dealt with a variety of medical problems, he fought to remain as independent as he could under the circumstances, and he rarely complained. Amazingly, as ill as he was toward the end, he even traveled down to Los Angeles for my oldest daughter's, my youngest daughter, Leah's bat mitzvah in October. That was just how devoted he was to his family. Mom deserves a world of credit for taking such good care of dad. With her as a constant by his side, we were able to have him with us for much longer than we expected. She has been absolutely selfless in caring for him these past several years, and we cannot thank you enough for that. On December 16th, my sweet, kind father passed away peacefully and comfortably. For us, our papa was larger than life in so many ways. It is difficult to accept that he is no longer here. We are fortunate that he leaves us with so, such a strong legacy and with so many happy memories together. It will be difficult to adjust to his absence, but of course, he will always be an important part of our lives. From the Calvi Daughters. Before we continue with words, there's going to be some music. Jeremy, grandson of Ula, is now going to play on the piano.
It up. Now we uh, will continue to uh, remember Ula and uh, Doc Finn, who has been a pastor here for many years. You probably know Ula better than any one of the other pastors that has been here. So, Doc Finn. Family. We are gathered here for a memorial service. It's a meaningful way to put it. Because we are all here to pay our tribute and love and respect to a man who has built his memorials in the hearts and minds of us all alike. To you, Cardi, and your great family. And uh, I have to include myself and my wife, uh, Edith, Edith. Because it so happened that I was appointed to serve as pastor of this lovely church on the Kirkebakken for 17 years in two periods. I was a lucky man. I met Ole Kahl, the president, a captain who could steer this ship in story more still, as we say in Norwegian. And uh, he always had the control <coughs> to make the right decisions at the right time. And we became good friends. However, we were mixed up at times in the Norwegian community. See, uh, my, my name is uh, Doug Finn Kalle. His name is Ole Kalle. So it happens at times that we were greeted this way. Good to see you, Pastor Kalle. <laughs> or you, Captain Kalle. <laughs> Ole, probably would have been a better pastor than I would have been a captain. <laughs> I want to have written a whole book about him. Maybe I should do that. <laughs> <coughs> because Ole was a multi-talented man. When he was uh, present for the Norwegian church, the Norwegian club, heading Nordmannsforbundet, or uh, being a wreck soul at the Norwegian Fish Club. His motto was always the same. The same as King Håkon the seventh of Norway. All for Norway. And, and with that enthusiasm, it was no wonder that he later was decorated by His Majesty, the King of <coughs> Norway, with uh, he was decorated with that medal. <coughs> Norwegian courses or programs were always his the top of his priority. After you, of course. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Norwegian uh, horses, and there were so many of them. But uh, 
I'm uh, just going to mention a couple. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, Roald Amundsen's ship Gøa. When uh, he had uh, completed the Northwest Passage as the first one in the world, he came to San Francisco in 1906. And he left his ship here. And uh, with the help of the uh, uh, Norwegian community, uh, the ship was uh, placed on Ocean Beach for 66 years. And, uh, you know, that's a long time. And uh, it's, it's a fact that the ship was neglected and even rotted. And as a Siemens pastor, I took thousands of seamen in the church bus, the Glorian, <laughs> to see uh, a year. And they were shocked finding out that the hippies were living in the ship and warming, warming themselves. And even uh, experiences within the ship, uh, the trip to the, to the Northwest Passage. And the, the seamen were simply shocked. And uh, we got the press, Norwegian press, interested. <clears throat> and a campaign, a campaign was started to bring Jura back to Norway. And the campaign, campaign ended up at uh, my dear Joseph Aliotto's office at the board of supervisor. And uh, they were so kind to grant the permission to let the ship be returned to Norway, their home country. It was a difficult issue until it reached the desk of Ole Kalm. Let me take care of it, <coughs> he said. I will let one of my ships start Billabong or star shipping hand me. And Ole went straight to work. And uh, the ship was brought to Pier 50. And uh, Chris Blom, he ordered a, a, what we call a Blom shine. <laughs> so it would look nice. And uh, all uh, the uh, the Knights of the Fish Club, and the Fulden Schultz of Dater, and even the pastor, we were handed a paintbrush, <laughs> and he painted. <laughs> and when it was finished, then uh, Ole Kalve said, gave the signal, and he hoisted the, you know, up on Star Billabong, and off the ship went with Ole Kalve on board, of course. <laughs> and uh, it reached Jura, it reached uh, Norway, Oslo, Bygdøy, the Maritime Museum, on the 2nd of June 1972, placed next to the big brother Ham uh, at, at Bygdøy. And when you come to, uh, to, you know, to Oslo next time, you have to go to Bygde and take a look at Jura. It's a house has been built on it now. And uh, Jura is a monument over <coughs> Roald Amundsen, but just as much as a monument of the Ole Kalve. That's the way he was. He fixed it. <laughs> Ole Kalve was a remarkable man. And you, 
you uh, have all the reasons to be proud. Uh, there's, uh, there's uh, one thing you have to notice. You, when you go upstairs, when you go upstairs afterwards, you will see some beautiful paintings where you, where you drink coffee. It wasn't like that all the time because uh, they were covered up. And he said, and he came to me and said, why do you cover up such beautiful Italian paintings? So I said, you see, at that time when the, uh, it became a church in 1951, then uh, uh, that was the altar up there. And I, I thought, well, that's not, uh, that's, that's too Italian, that's too, uh, <laughs> too much more. <laughs> so they covered it up, but it was visible on the, on, uh, on the other side. And then the older colleague came to me and he said, I cover this up. Well, it was probably not uh, too good for an altarpiece. So let us bring them back. Let us do the work. And I was, I almost said, Hallelujah. <laughs> and, uh, and go upstairs and see. It's a beautiful painting. But uh, <clears throat> I have to say one more thing about him before I end. I have to praise him <coughs> for uh, uh, something else we have to see afterwards. Because uh, the pastor and the church, they always wanted to have an anchor in the, on, on the lawn below the church. But that, that wasn't easy. You couldn't get one. But then uh, <coughs> the house mother had uh, a visit from his, uh, her father, Freeman uh, Scheie. And he said, uh, maybe you, you should try to, <coughs> you are from Kopevik, maybe uh, that's on the west coast of your part from Kalu. So maybe you could search there for, a, for a, an anchor. Well, a few days after he went back, came back to Norway, he called me up and said, uh, Glorious news. I have found an anchor in Kopevik, and they will, the, the, the owner of it, will give it to the, to the church free without charge. But we have to bring it back to, you have to bring it back to, to Norway. Well, what did I do? I called Ole Kalve. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, told him the story and it said the same thing leave it to me <laughs> leave it to me I will bring it back on uh, one of my ship, ships and uh, uh, a few months later it arrived in uh, Sacramento and uh, we brought it down here and it is now on the lawn <laughs> just below the church and if it hadn't been for a call it would not happen so go down take a look at it and uh, be inspired by it and also uh, bow your head in gratitude for what he did. And an anchor is a great symbol on a day like this. It is a Christian symbol of hope. 
Then you read from 1 Corinthians 13, chapter, about what Apostle Paul said about hope and faith, and the greatest of all, which is love. So, uh, to his family, the party, and all his children and grandchildren and the family, even from Seattle, his grandchildren from Seattle. Uh, we are all of this moment reminded uh, of the anchor, the hope. And uh, Ole is now safe in the hands of the almighty, everlasting God. And uh, we bless him for his memorizing him and for his legacy what he meant to all of us. God bless you all. Thank you, Dr. Kavala. <laughs> I, I do know what you're talking about. It's one or two letters. <laughs> but um, Ulu was the president, as was mentioned. Um, the church needs its Lord, but it also needs its president. We have one today as well. Knut Akset, he will now say a few words in remembrance of Ulu. Kari, <coughs> Elizabeth, Seed, Hilda, Caroline, all others of the big family and friends. Ole was a great friend of this church, the very best. He served on the board of directors for 30 years, and from 1982 till 2001, he was the president. This worldwide institution was important in Ole's life. He had a long relationship with the Norwegian Siemens Church and the Siemens Mission, as it used to be called earlier. Well before arriving in San Francisco, he had visited many of the churches around the world as he sailed. Further, the major event we heard about earlier took place at the Siemens Church in Sweden on January 23, 1965. Their golden jubilee was just a month away when he left. During his tenure here, there were good times and challenging times. Uncountable, joyous occasions sprinkled with sorrow and sadness. But that is life. This is one of the times we are sad and we are longing for the one that's gone. But at the same time, we are grateful for having had Ulla among us. In the early 80s, during the recession, the financial difficulties here were dire. With Ulla's wise guidance, the church came through and again flourished. He oversaw many major renovations and improvements, and he really cared about making this place a good place, safe. He had a keen eye for what was needed and saw to it that the facility was always in tip-top shape. When the king and queen came visiting in 1995, everything was ready, and Ulla made sure the event was successful. At the turn of the millennium, the church was rocked by some turmoil caused by folks who never really explained what their issue was. Perhaps they did not have a clear understanding of this church's proper mission, or did not have a right grasp of the laws that governs charities here in California. In an effort to keep the peace, Ula unselfishly stepped aside, but the storm still raged on for a while. Ula kept a low profile, but continued to give well-reasoned advice for those of us who continued. On many occasions I spoke with him, and this congregation's gratitude was communicated to him for his steadfast leadership. 
it is unfortunate that he fell on ill health and was unable to come back and partake in the many celebrations and joyous occasions we had at this place, which was so dear to him. Ulle was also a good friend of mine. I first met him here in the early 70s. Later on, actually soon thereafter, we became business associates as I had started a logistics company. Star Shipping's West Coast office, where Ulle was in charge, became a great dependable resource for me personally. For years, my company shipped containers on virtually every star vessel that sailed out the Golden Gate. The service were reliable, punctual, the very best. In between our two companies, for two decades, we handled the moving of every Siemens pastor via containers on star vessels, starting with Kalga. <laughs> in 1975, then Hope, Frode Knudsen, Lund, and Ilbeck, after which time Bala came back for a final stint. It all went well, except for one mishap. When one car belonging to an assistant was flushed overboard by a large breaker as soon as the vessel got out into the open sea. The car floated and bobbed around in the waves for quite a while was irretrievable, and as the ship sailed on, the car sank. Fortunately, there was sufficient insurance, insurance. but I doubt that if Ulla Kalva had been on the bridge, that would not have happened. <laughs> Star Shipping is primarily a bulk cargo carrier, and as such, is one of the largest in the world. Since World War II, the Norwegian company Yara, previously Norsk Hydro, has been the leading producer of mineral fertilizer in the world. Fertilizer is the food plants need to provide the bountiful harvest. Without it, the world starves. Millions of tons of this product used for growing crops in the Central Valley of California has for decades been transported from Heraya in Norway to the port of Stockton via star vessels. Outbound star transports food products back to Europe and the rest of the world. There was a very good reason for Star wanting to have a seasoned, capable manager here on the West Coast who could maintain and build the business. Captain Kala <laughs> was that man, and he really made a difference, and this, the trade is still going strong. I'm aware of many of Ola's accomplishments. I've been touched on a couple. They are numerous. As a consumer of start services, I had the privilege of being invited on board some of the new vessels when they came to port for the first time. The captain was mighty proud, and he had reason to be. The ships were the finest. He was also a great host for the Christmas luncheons for the clients of his. I remember when back at the office, one of my employees who had met the captain for the first time said, Captain Kalva, has these really big hands and the most <laughs> sincere handshake. He is the kind of person you know by first encounter you can trust. Most of you here have surely felt that handshake. I dare say few had the ability to convey so much by merely a touch. Ulle was loved and will never truly leave us. He will live on in kindness that he sowed, comfort he shared, and the love he brought into our lives. When I learned of Ola's passing, I communicated this back to Norway, to Halstan Bundeby, who for many years had been the Secretary General of the Siemens Church, Norwegian Church Abroad. Bundeby wrote back and asked me to convey as follows. Captain Ola Kalven was one of the few I had the opportunity to meet before I worked as visiting pastor on many occasions in San Francisco from the year 2001 onward. <coughs> Already before that, as Secretary General, I had various opportunities to meet Ola, starting in the late 70s. He led the Church of <coughs> Board of Directors with a firm and steady hand, as he had previously been a sea captain. He knew the needs and wishes of the seafarers, and with his position and connections, he had the opportunity to serve the Church in so many ways. But most of all, I remember his personal abilities and qualities, his recent analysis his solid knowledge, his practical judgment, his engagement for the Seaman Church, and his general attitude towards the institution, which he loved so much, and which he gave so much of his time and of 
his resources. He was always preoccupied with what would serve the Siemens Church, and he wished so much that this house would be able to provide the best service to the activity which is here conducted. He spent countless hours for the betterment of this institution, whether it was on the board of directors or in overalls, scraping paint, <laughs> any day of the week. I'm grateful for the privilege of meeting and getting to know this towering man in the congregation in San Francisco. He now rests in peace after a task well done. In thankfulness and respect, I bless his name in peace. Thomas Van Wonder. I also got an email from you now on that. And he uh, sent his regards to you, Kali, and the rest of the family. Uh, I remember in 89 when I was here that uh, it was the good times. It was, uh, but I remember even Anna was sometimes worried. You know, he was concerned about whatever there was. But what I remember that that was always fixed. And I was kind of the janitor here, and I, I didn't fix it. <laughs> so, so I know that somebody else took care of that. And I assumed that it was school that, that, that did those things. Because again, I, I didn't do much. I, well, I, I met people and visited folks, though. But he was there, and he was, uh, you know, they always were taking care of painting and, and making sure that this this church looked, looked as good as it should, should be. So, you know, in sense is regards. Uh, finally, Sven, brother Sven, will say a few words. Six years old, and he was ten years older. He was a ten teenager, and uh, the one who we followed, I think, my brother Daryl's and I, uh, he would we go and hunt for a Christmas tree on our island or on the neighboring island. We always found one that might we need some repair of our restoration when we got back with it. <laughs> Make sure that all the limbs were in the places we wanted them to be. But we we did it. We did this on Lily Yulat and the little Christmas Eve, the twenty third, and put the tree in its place that day and next day decorated it and a little and went around it holding hands and singing. It, those are memories from my early days and Ole is just a big part of those memories. Ole as a big br brother was also one who did a lot of the work in on our yard and on our courtyard and on our island. And in the winter uh, there was a big herring fishing fisheries, uh, which uh, we had, our family had been part of for generations. Uh, so we salted the herring, processed them. That required people. Ola was the one who, who organized and led that work. Mm -hmm. uh, neighboring people would come and help when we had herring to get it processed on time. And I had, I remember one time it was uh, pretty special for me. I was charged with going up on the hill and holding the flag indicating that we, we, we need people here now. <laughs> <laughs> Processed the herring. They, they, they were salted and uh, he's the one who controlled the salinity of the water they were placed in. and. Once they were 
finished and sealed in the barrel. He's the one who transported them in a, probably a, a rowboat to a nearby cove that uh, uh, was not visible for people on vessels going by. We kept them out of the way of, of the formal economy and, and so because these were occupied time and we, we wanted to direct them in non-formal uh, economic processes. Uh, once he went to uh, seaman school and for a year and then off to sea, it was exciting to get cards, letters from him. Uh, Perhaps I think of them now as more frequently than they actually occurred, but they, they were important, <laughs> you know, and they were exciting. And they were from exciting places that, that uh, I have thought of and had been in my memory and thought of him forever, uh, well, for, for those, the years since. One of which is Trinidad and Tobago. I, I enjoy that name particularly, <laughs> and the stamp uh, from it. And I hope to visit there in not too long. Um, I still have some of those stamps. I think uh, um, one time he, he was in. Not not very often did these ship uh, return to to Norway, but one time there was a ship there, and it may have been a ship that he transferred to Norway on, but we took the coastal steamer to Bergen. And my, my father, who was a widower by then, and my younger brother and I went there to see him, and that was exciting. That was a big excitement for us. Um, one of the, my favorite authors and books is... Um, Sora Neil Hurston, who wrote in uh, Their Eyes Are Watching God, distant ships at sea carry all men's dreams. Pardon me. I, I, I thought of that with a wood lamp, and I realized that he lived that dream. He lived it going throughout the world on his ships. He lived it finding his bride on the ship. And some of his daughters sailed with him on the ship. Uh, it, um, it was a dream. So we <coughs> We're glad that he brought his family, or jointly they came here to the United States where we had been for a while. It was good to spend time on the same coast with them, same time. It's good to visit the home in uh, San Francisco Bay Area <coughs> where my big brother lived and his family. Thank you. Final hymn and to the committal, we will all pray. And I will do this first in Norwegian, and then we're going to close with the Lord's Prayer that you will feel free to, to pray in your own, in the language which is closest to your heart. Now, Spear, Evi Gud, vår tilflukt i sorgens tid, der nærmer din fred, styrk oss i troen, i oss fremtid og håp. Vi takker dig for Ole, for det du ga oss gjennom hans liv. Barmhjertige Gud, vi overgir ham i dine hender, du som har skapt oss i ditt bilde, og gitt 
oss, Jesus Kristus, som vår frelser. Reis oss opp på oppstandelsens dag til evig liv hos deg. Fader vår, du som er i himmelen, la ditt navn holdes hellig, la ditt rike komme, la din vilje skje på jorden som i himmelen. Gi oss i dag vårt daglige brød. Forlat oss vår skyld, som vi også forlater våre skyldnere. Led oss ikke inn i fristelse, men frens oss fra det onde. For rike er ditt, og makten og æren i evig. As I said um, early on, this is, um, in the Norwegian tradition, the most important one. Uh, funerals in the old times, and I guess when Ole grew up, were mostly held at home. They would have the memorial at home, and if the weather um, was good, you, you, know, could, you could make a grave. But in the northern parts, you know, where there was a lot of ice and it was it was hard, the ground was hard. You had to wait until springtime. And then the pastor, what he would do then, would do the commitment. That was the only thing that they required the pastor for. I don't know why, but that's the way it was. But the rest was taken care of by, by friends and families, the memorial. So that is still there, and when we talked about it, Kari, I, I, I sort of think that that is a good way to connect to, to the old country, uh, that we actually do the committal here later on. We're going to bring him up to Marin, where he's where he will put to rest with, along with his daughter. So I will do this all in Norwegian. I fathers og sønnens og den helions navn. Amen. Ole, av jord er du kommet, til jord skal du bli. Av jorden skal du igjen oppstå. Lovet være Gud, vår Herre Jesu Kristi far, han som i sin rike miskun har født oss på ny og gitt oss et levende håp ved Jesu Kristi oppstandelse fra de døde. 
Herren vil signe deg og bevare deg. Herren la sitt ansikt lyse over deg og være deg nådig. Herren løpte sitt åsyn på deg, Ole, og gi deg fred i Faderens og Sønnens og den hellige ånds navn. Amen. For Herre Jesu Kristi nåde og hans samfunn være med oss. Thank you all for coming. Uh, the family has also asked me to say that whoever has the time, you're mostly welcome to come upstairs to have some coffee and to share more memories about Ule and uh, take a look at all the, you know, go down and look at the anchors and look at the, the, the paintings and all that. And as I said, you're most welcome. So, but down here, we're, it's all over and uh, we continue upstairs. So thank you again for coming. Thank you. So, thank you.